Hello, my name is Doug McGee. I'm an interviewer for the Public Library of Cincinnati in Hamilton County. I'm interviewing Ed Donnelly on the 16th of January, 2007, at the main library. Our camera operator today is Dennis Daly. Also present are Scott Donnelly, Linda Sandusky, and Maggie Horsley. So, further, let's get started. Perhaps you can tell us some of your vivid recollections from the war. Uh, well, let's, let's see. My Marine Corps just started November the 10th, 1942. Uh, I was part of what was known then as a Cincinnati platoon. There were some little over 60 young men joined up and they held them up until November the 10th and sent us all to Paris Island uh, on November the 10th. And as, as I said, it was known as the Cincinnati Platoon. I think it was sponsored by the Enquirer, Enquirer paper. So that was the start of it. Uh, let me back you up for a minute if I can. Uh, December, December 7th, where were you? And December the 7th? Uh, I was either bowling or getting ready to bowl <laughs> at Tramer's Bowling Alley in Lachlan, which is no longer there. And I didn't know where Pearl Harbor was either, so I didn't bother me. <laughs> and you're how old at the time? I was probably 20, 21. Okay. And you'd grown up in Cincinnati? And you'd grown up here? Yeah. Yeah, I uh, grew up in Carthage. That's about 10 miles a little north of downtown Cincinnati. So the news of Earl Harbor didn't have any effect right away? No, not, not too much. Uh, of course, uh, every day you, you read about it and you got more, and you finally found out where it was. And little did I know at that time that I would have spent some time on, the, on Pearl Harbor. <coughs> So what, what were you doing at age 22 in, in Laughlin? Well, I was working at the, the Tool Steel Gear and Pinion Company at that time, which is in Elmwood Place. And they, uh, they had moved to Sharonville and changed their name to x -Tech now. But this, I worked a while and then decided to join the, the Corps and uh, X tool seal was something I didn't have nothing to do with for about three years, but my time counted it for. Um, and how did you arrive on the Marines as opposed to other services? If I'm not mistaken, I, I was thinking about joining the Navy, but there was such a long line there, <laughs> and a short line for the Marine Corps. <laughs> I took, I took the short line. <laughs> okay. And like they said, when, they, when we took a truck into Paris Island, all the boots that were there and in boot camp were all in yelling, you'll be sorry. <laughs> I, we got that for quite a while. But I enjoyed it. Uh, you meet a lot of fine people and uh, I had a lot of good times in it. No reservations about going in the Marines? And, no. Uh, you know, so you went as a unit from Cincinnati, mm -hmm. and you knew some of the people? Or? I knew, uh, let's see, I knew four. <laughs> Another guy worked at the shop with me after he found out that I joined. He went down and joined, and a couple of other ones I knew joined. Uh, I take it you weren't married at the time? Or? No. Okay. No. Uh, I didn't get married until after the war. But it was an experience. It's, it's, it's like night and day from military life to, <laughs> to her regular normal living, you know. And we, uh, from, from there we went to, uh, after Paris Island we went to uh, 
April, June, April, June. Uh, cold, sweating tents and no heat. We put everything on when we went to bed. Overcoats and everything. But we we didn't have to put up with that too long, maybe six weeks, and it shipped us to uh, Oceanside, California, Camp, Camp Pendleton, which was, uh, it was so much different from what we'd been used to. The, the weather was great, we had barracks to sleep in, the food was good, the Liberty was good, the LA was 90 miles from there, uh, San Diego was 40 miles. It was real, real nice. I, I enjoyed it. Uh, so, how much time was it from the when you left Cincinnati till you actually got on the ship to go overseas? Well, let's see, four to four. Well, from forty-two to the end of forty-three. So your, your training was about six months total. Or? Uh, uh, a little longer than that. Anyway, we, uh, I think uh, D-Day on the we first engagement was the Marshall Islands. And in the meantime, we had been separated. We were with, they sent us all of different places. And I went with, they sent me to the 4th Division, which we, they was establishing at that time. And we, uh, like I said, D-Day was right around the... Uh, 6th of June? No. Oh, it was 40, January of 44, I think. Before, yeah. It, which was, it wasn't much of an island. It was just two small islands. The, the Marshalls? The Marshall Islands? The, well, the two islands that we went in on, one was Roy and one was Namur, no, no and they were right by each other. But very small. You could fire a rifle, I think, over the width of it. And we lost some men there, but compared to the other places, it was, I don't even know why they stopped there. They could have bombed it off of, out of the water. And from there, we went back to Maui in the Hawaiian Islands for our own base. Pretty island, nice island. And we trained there. And then left, uh, left there and made a landing on Saipan, June the 15th, I think it was. There were Saipan and Tinian. Well, Saipan was a pretty good sized island. I was wounded on Saipan then, too. And, uh, I guess you probably want to hear about that. Huh? <laughs> okay. There's so many of them. Uh, we were going through a, a, a sugar cane field. And uh, it wasn't it wasn't ripe at the time, it was level. And uh, it wasn't too much of a job to take that part of the island. But uh, we ran into a little hutch on, on, the, on the one side of the sugar cane field. And of course they sent a couple of Marines up there to make sure there was no Japs there. And uh, it was clear. And we started through again and by the time I got up there, well, we hadn't seen too much action. And I got past it, and I heard somebody holler, look out ahead, or there's a Jap or something, and I turned around to this Jap. How he, they missed him in that shack, I don't know. But he come out of the, he come out of the shack and was turning a little corner there, and he had a, his Jap rifle, fixed band in it, his Jap rifle, and, and a hand grenade in his other hand. He didn't throw the hand grenade, he just tossed it. Well, I hit the deck one like this, and I, when it went off, I knew I was hit, but it really didn't hurt that much. It's, what I was worried about was him coming at me with that fixed bayonet. 
But anyway, somebody shot him, and um, I got through through that all right. But I, a part of the hand grenade shrapnel hit me in the arm and up uh, underneath my helmet. Not nothing. Uh, Bad enough that it was serious enough to take take my life, but uh, in fact I didn't even worry about it until the next morning. My arm had swelled up about like that, and they sent me to the uh, uh, service station first day, and they said we're going to ship. Since you got on the ship, there was a hospital ship. And we could see it from where we were. USS uh, Solus Bay, the USS Solus Bay hospital ship. And it was good to get on there and get a cup of hot coffee, you know, <laughs> and a bed to sleep in. But uh, from there, they sent me down to, when the ship got loaded, they sent us down to Guadalcanal Hospital. Which wasn't much of a lot of tents and Quonset huts. And they didn't have much to work with, but they did the best they could. We stayed there maybe, maybe three or four weeks. And that shipped us to New Caledonia, which was a nicer island. And we stayed there a couple of weeks. Then back to Pearl Harbor, Pearl Harbor back over to Maui, and I rejoined my old outfit, which was good for me. Yeah. So then we uh, went, went into training again, and we trained, and we trained. But it was, it was a good island, it was nice people. We got liberty. Then we left, and nobody knew where we were going. Never did know where we were going until we were out a couple of days. And uh, finally they said we were going to Iwo Jima. Well, it, before that, after they took Saipan, they went over and took Tinian. I wasn't with them then. But then they took Tinian and then the, the group went back to Maui and that's where I joined them. But nobody knew anything about Tinian. It was a little small island. No problem. Is that a couple, three days we'd probably take it. Well, that didn't work out that way. And we landed on uh, on Evo, February the 19th, 1945. Uh, that was a job. Volcanic ash covered the whole island. And when you're trying to make a beachhead, you're usually going up. And you take a couple of steps forward and slide back a step or two. And it was a job getting the, the big guns in there. In fact, they were bogged down, and the next day they got some bulldozers in there where they could get them out, get them up on the top where they were a little more solid. And our uh, our order was to go in, the first day was to go in 400 yards, which was the first airport. We were ordered to go in 400 yards and dig in and stay there for the night. Hell, yeah, we didn't get off of the off of the beach till the next day, and really surprisingly, we didn't see a whole lot of jacks. There were uh, there was a lot of caves, and uh, they were hidden, protected by these caves, and uh, it usually took the flamethrower outfit to go up to. The, these kids and give them a blast of flame and until they come out. Well, eventually they all come out, and then that's when the, the war got pretty rough. You just got to a point where you didn't, you wasn't really sure you were going to make it back or not, you know. And it's hard to explain, but it gives you a, kind of another feeling about life that, you know, if they're going to kill me, it, it, they better kill me before I kill them because uh, that's what it was. You either get killed or be killed. Or badly wounded. And that went on until February, March the 
16th, I think it was, a little over a month. But we all got well educated in what war really means. They fought it, we fought a different type of war than they're having over East now. It was just a different type of war. So when you were first attacking the marshals, what was your um, your first onslaught? What was your reaction? Were you scared to death, and everyone? No, if it were, they didn't show it. I tried to not show it, <laughs> uh, but it it was almost a wasted effort, really. They must have had some reason to take this shit out of it. They weren't big enough for anything. That strip they had on there was short. The short strip, no big plane could land it on. So you didn't really feel you're a, a real veteran until Iwo Jima, or? Well, that night it got a little, uh, you could hear shooting and firing and gun hollering. But the next day, it was just a two or three day job and it was over. And it didn't take long to get us back to Pearl or back to Maui. Did you think it was going to be like that for the rest of the war? Or? Uh, I, I didn't give, give that much thought. It would have been nice if it was, but <laughs> we lost a lot of men. And, uh, well, it was something like 7,000 on Iwo. Any idea how many of, of your unit? Just the ones that I was, uh, see, I, I was what they call a forward observer. We, we trained with the artillery, but in combat, we went in with the, the infantry. And my job was to pick out a heavy concentration of, of the enemy and direct fire onto that concentration. It's a pretty risky job. Yeah. <laughs> you, uh, they're looking for it. They didn't last very long. <laughs> now a very good friend of mine who also was an observer. Uh, he, uh, this was on, this was on Evo. Uh, we had, we had just completed a fire mission and I called ceasefire. Then I am. Um, I told Red, a guy, Red, Red Jones, and John, a guy by the name of Johnny DeStefanis, and me were just the three of them. The two guys helped carry the wires and the phone and thing. And we were uh, looking, getting a better position to see what how much damage we had done on, on that fire mission. When we heard, would, would somebody please help me? And Red said, that sounded like Mac, McGowan, his name was McGowan. And we heard it again, won't somebody help me? So we were on a little bit of a hill, about a 20 degree hill, it wasn't very steep. So all, th all three of us jumped up and run down trying to locate that, and it didn't take as long to locate him. And it was back, but he was, he was 30 or 40 yards in, in that little patch of sugar cane. Like I said, it wasn't much there, but you could see. And uh, I told Red, I said, cover me, I'll go get him. Well, the Japs were on the other side of the the hill, and as, as soon as I got out in the open, they started firing, and I had to crawl the, all the way up there. And when I got to him, he, he was, his arm was just hanging. He had a hole in the side, about the size of a grapefruit, and one of his legs was nearly torn off. And I told him, I said, Smack, hold on, I'll go back and get some morphine. And I had to look up a medic, try to help him, the, help him with his pain. And I did, I, I found a medic pretty quick and I told him the situation. 
And he said, I'll go with you. And I said, no, you, you better stay here. All I'm going to do is give him a shot of that morphine, which he agreed with. And, uh, and I did give it to him. I don't think it helped. Now, how, how was I going to get him back? It was, that was a question. I couldn't carry him. He was too big and heavy. So I had to be while laying out on a poncho and, and pulling the crawl. And it was a job getting him on that poncho. I tried to move him and he tried to help him. He wasn't doing no good. Finally, I got a, what I thought was enough of him on the poncho to give it a try. So I, uh, I laid down, prone all the way down, tried to pull him. It didn't work. It, so I had to get up on my knees and that worked a little better. And as soon as we got out, they opened the fire open up the red. He had picked up four or five more riflemen and when we got out in the open, he opened fire against the Japs, which saved our lives. I finally got close enough for two guys to run out and help, <coughs> help me uh, get him back. And I laid him down and his eyes was open. I told him to hang in there or, or uh, back because they were going to take you over to the aid station. And he closed his eyes. And I heard that afternoon that he had died on the way to the first aid station. But he, he died there right there when he closed his eyes. That was hard to take. He was a good guy from New York. That was the, probably the worst encounter I had. And there were so many of them. Of course, you, the ones you know hurt worse than, uh, you know. So this is uh, Iwo Jima. Is that right? or, no, that, was, that was Iwo Jima. Yeah. And where did you hit from there? After Iwo Jima, where were you sent? We went back to Maui. And the, the, the rumor was that we were the next would be Japan. And in the meantime, the other outfits were going to work on uh, some islands in between. But uh, that didn't happen. Uh, old Harry dropped that bomb and that, and that took, that saved a lot of lives, our lives, not theirs, our lives. When people condemn that decision to do that, they don't know what the hell they're talking about. That. Yeah, I think it saved lives on both sides. And had you had to take the home islands of Japan, it would have taken a long time, mm -hmm. and Japan would never have forgiven this yeah. country. Uh, but uh, when did you hear about Roosevelt? Though? When I hear about what? The death of Roosevelt. Was that a blow? I was sitting in a, on Maui, they had a little town called Kalua, and Punane and all them names. I was sitting inside a theater with a girlfriend that I'd made over there. When they stopped the show, they announced it. That was, that was quite a shock, yeah. At what time did you conclude that you pretty well were going to win this war after all? That, uh, well, uh, of course, when the news came about the uh, atom bomb, I, nobody knew anything. It was right. just what the, the damage that it had done with just one bomb. But the uh, morale went sky high because we, we figured that they had to give up. But did, any time before that, did you feel that things were pretty well going your way? And well, we, I think we knew we would win, uh, but we, we also knew at the time that Japan would have to be invaded. 
and that could take months and months. Yeah. So the end wasn't in doubt, it was just a matter of when and what the cost. Okay. Mm -hmm. How did you uh, feel about Europe? Did you think that Europe got all the headlines and the, and the attention and, and you didn't, or? Actually, I'd have, I'd have hated to have been in Europe, mainly because of the weather. <laughs> it, got, it got so cold and there was no place to go to warm up. <laughs> we didn't have that problem in the Pacific. Although some nights got cold, you know, but not you know, freezing cold. And you never had a problem with illness or malaria or heat? Or no. <laughs> no. I remember one night in uh, Maui, they had an outside theater, just a screen. And we were sitting there on the ground watching the theater. And we, all of a sudden we heard a big rumbling, like, to me it sounded like a big six by truck got loose and coming right down that little hill. And then quite a few guys were seriously wounded and trying to get out of the way. It, it wasn't no, nothing at all. It was, uh, it, was, it was a truck, but it wasn't a runaway truck, you know what I mean? Maybe because of all the tension and nerves were starting to do their job, you know, as uh, most of us. Uh, any rivalry between the services? As, did you feel superior to the Army and the Navy? Uh, well, we felt superior, but I think probably every, everyone in their, in their branch felt that way. They should have felt that way. But I think our training was better than the, than the rest. Yeah, you mentioned the training. Uh, that in the middle of the war they sent you back for more training. And, and what was the difference between? Same thing. Same thing? Uh, well, you can only do a different thing. My, my big problem was learning how to judge distance. Same distance. And, and being a caddy when I was young, <laughs> and, and, and working with guys who played <laughs> and trying to figure out how far was to the green, I think that helped me. The, the way this, it works, after you've got your, uh, your four battery, your four guns in position, it was either a 75, a 105, or a 155 howitzers. You got to pick out a spot where everybody can see zero in on. It could be a a house or a, a steeple. Or what 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 you do is like I would pick out something. I say it's a, a house, and I would tell the number one gun to up six hundred, fire one round. Well, maybe that round would drop. 400. So and then I'd say up 200, right 200, trying to get the. Right. And I'd keep that up until uh, I got that zeroed in. And that would be your. Uh, that would be the, the first. You can have as many uh, areas like that as, as you need, but uh, if I have to see a concentration, maybe way to the left of that base point. They're called base point. I say a base point up 600, down 400. And then you work from that, that, uh, that so way. How did you become a forward artillery observer? Huh? They told me I was going to be. With no aptitude, just <laughs> curious? <laughs> no, uh, I, uh, I had no idea what it was. And, uh, I didn't think, I, I know it's succeeding more, is the life expectancy of that position was not very good because no, if, the enemy, if the enemy didn't get you, your friendly fire overhead would. Yeah. So, did you ever have trouble with that? The short well, time? I've been in the enemy problem, problem but if no. I were, I don't know of any time that 
my own troops were firing. I'm thinking the, the artillery you're calling in that got fell a little short. You know? Yeah. That's happened, I'm sure, but I don't recall. Hmm. Uh, how do you feel about the the officers? Were you well led? We had good, good officers. Good, uh, uh, good confidence in in your leadership. They know yeah, they yeah, we had we had two good ones. Lieutenant Alden, and he always picked me to go with him. I asked him one day, can't you pick somebody, you know somebody else you can pick? It? Because you could talk to him like that. He was, he was a good guy. But there's no question of confidence when they tell you that you're going to go 4,000 yards into Iwo Jima and you, you're still on the beach. Did, did you wonder, do these guys know what they're doing? Or? Uh, no, because you're right there too. You're, you're, okay. Uh, you know what's going on. How about the, the big names and the, uh, I understand the Marines weren't too fond of MacArthur, or uh, for the most part. Oh, I guess you hear some of that, but uh, yeah. that's few and a bit right. far between, you know. Yeah, they'd say, look at MacArthur, he was a, well, he was, he was an army man, I guess he was a good army man. He was a general. Uh, I guess uh, the, one of the things I've always wondered about, when you finally split, when demobilized, or sent packing, uh, what, how did that work? Uh, I figure here you are with these guys that you give your life for, that you're probably closest to. The you mean like at the end of the war? And just. Everybody packs up and leaves. Well, you've been over or away from home so long and you're, you're dying to get back. It didn't bother me. Uh, we were, well, we come in San Diego when we come back. And then the San Diego, they put us back in the Pendleton, which we had been before. And from Pendleton, it would then take them on put us on a train and head us back to Cincinnati. And uh, well, the one time. guy, I, on the Cincinnati platoon, I met him. We left together and we, on the same trains, we come back on the same trains and we were discharged at the same time. A friend of mine, uh, he just died over a year or so. But he, we were together the whole, whole time. So no sense of loss, or I guess you're too eager to get back on. Didn't, didn't really think about the unit you were leaving. Not really. Okay. No. Everybody probably felt the same that they were dying to get home. Uh, I am. I wouldn't marry. I did, didn't go back to work for two or three weeks. But uh, I thought I was in pretty good shape, but uh, I wasn't as good as I thought. I'd go out at night and get in arguments and mm -hmm. taking everything personal. And that's just part of the war, working on you. It took a long time to get over that. Did you see that in other people? I've seen it in some. Uh, of course, they, they probably didn't know what to call it then, or? I guess it's a form of combat to take. Some, uh, some guy, uh, this one particular guy, wound up my brother-in-law, he from Dayton. He uh, had more guts than sense, but they, I didn't see this. They tell me that they were getting, they were on one side of the airport. And they were getting a lot of heavy fire, and uh, Joe just threw his rifle away. It's caught up and started walking across the airport with the jacks on the other side. And somebody went, had to run out and get him. And it wasn't because of the lack of nerve. Was he, that guy, he was tough. It just, it, 
so much, you know, you can only take so much. So you had some trouble reassimilating into the into civilian life? Yeah, I, I had a little trouble, uh, not much. Okay, nightmares? Or? Oh, I've had those. Did always? Uh, that's pretty much all the left. I don't have those no more. I dream of them some once in a while. Mm -hmm. But we're waking up hollering or... I don't think I do that anymore. <laughs> he'd tell me, he sleeps down in the basement, so he'd tell me about what I did. Hey, what are you doing over there? Oh, she's sleeping. Uh, I never asked you uh, where you were when they said the war is over. On Maui. Oh, okay. So we got to Hawaii quite a bit then. Yeah, well, that was our own base, yeah. And, uh, oh, a couple years. We were there. You ever been back? Yes. We, uh, a friend of mine had his 25th anniversary, so I said, let's go to Hawaii. And he had okay, so with our wine, we went back. If I'd have been smart, I'd have bought a little bit of my way up, but <laughs> been a millionaire by right now. Any uh, reunions with your group? Uh, There's a guy in uh, Webster, New York, uh, Harry Wright. Uh, oh, 10, 15 years ago, he he wrote me a letter that they were going to have a little reunion and, at his place. And uh, we drove up there, and there was only maybe 15 of us attended. But then every other year, he would have the same thing. And eventually, they got down last time, I think it was about seven or eight, dying off and problems. But it was, it was fun to do it. See how they all come out. He had a nice place right on the lake. Okay. Um, what do you think of the talk of the best generation, or the greatest generation, sorry? The uh, people who fought in World War II? Or... Uh, I, I didn't know about the greatest generation. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody told me. Yeah. Which, which is all right. I, I have no problem with it. It's, I can't complain about my life. Do uh, you, you think yours, your generation, was different than others, and uh, or do you think, given a similar challenge, maybe the current people would step up as as you you did? Well, I think there was a good batch of people in my age. I'm eighty. Six? You sure? <laughs> uh, and all those people in, in that that age group are good people. In fact, most people are good people. I oh, you get some wrong dumbs, but everybody gets those. No, I think it's the idea that you've probably gone through the Depression together and mm -hmm. knew what it was like to not have things. And well, everybody was poor during the uh, 30s. Right. And here, the world, world War II comes along, and you could have said, not me, it's not my war, but mm -hmm. it went. And then when you came home, you seemed to dedicate yourself to building your communities. People yeah. would say, nowadays, we're more interested in building our living rooms than our communities. And, uh, well, I, uh, I always had a job. It was during the Depression, but uh, part of it was, but, uh, you know, I always had a job. Working 12 hours a night. And then I started a, a job, I worked at 6 in the night to 6 in the morning. And I, I had been working at a job making 65 cents an hour. So I started this job like at six at night and six in the morning for 40 cents an hour. <laughs> I ain't too smart. And in a couple of months, we were going from six at night to seven in the morning. 13 hours a night at 40 cents an hour. Of course, I got a big raise when I come back after uh, 
the war I think I was making 65 <laughs> but that place was, uh, was noted for long hours and uh, bonuses every month I, I made the right decision uh, how was the communication with home when you're in the Pacific uh, regular mail no problem well yeah uh, my I, my dad had been killed when I was young, very young, and I only had my uh, my mother and my grandmother. They kept me busy writing letters back and forth. And did they say how they were doing on this rationing and shortages? Or did they ever complain? No. If they did, I didn't know about. But that's pretty much the, what half my life from 20 to 23 or 40, I guess. But there's a lot of boys that had, that had a lot worse than I did. But for the most part, your, your unit turned out well, and successful jobs and careers, and your reunion, you said. My career? In, the, the, in your unit when you got together with the people. Oh, the yeah, unit. some of them did real well. In fact, Jimmy, where he lived, he built that house himself, a big, beautiful home. And uh, they all did pretty well out there. Well, anything more you have to say or summary? Contributions, it's quite a tale. Mm -hmm. um, you have anything to summarize or to add? Right. Well, when I went back to work, I walked through, I'd uh, I'd, uh, I'd go, go in and see some of the guys that I hadn't seen for a while. I walked through the office, and there was a young girl sitting there, and I didn't know her. She wound up being my wife. We were going to go over and watch a bowl. And we had three kids. But I lost her back in March. So you're a war hero when you returned? Hmm? Were you a war hero when you returned then? Or I was a war hero than anybody else that was in. No. Just do the best you can to keep alive. I'm certainly glad you made it. Thank you for your contribution. Uh, that's about all we have. Unless you have anything more to tell us. Well, no, let's see. I don't like what's going on over in the East, but I don't think many people do. We dig up Harry and let Harry run that show for a while. <laughs> You're a Truman fan? <laughs> and a kind of Truman, just like your generation here, fell into something accidentally and did a pretty, very great job with what he had. Mm -hmm. Nobody that's expected him to. That's right. Oh, well, yeah, thank you for what you've done for your country.